Okay, so we're basically just going to do a Q and A question, uh, section here, unless you would like to please go ahead and just give us a lot more background than I would personally know. Background. Well, okay. In case you don't know, yeah, my name is Mike Quinn, and I started out as a puppeteer for Jim Henson. Um, uh, when Alan was on the very first uh, project I worked on, which was the Great Muppet Caper. Yep. And the yeah, the Dark Crystal. And then Return of the Jedi, and uh, so I still work with Muppets now, and, and, um, uh, and uh, in the new uh, Star Wars trilogy as well, with my character Nine Numb, which I'm mostly known for. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, but Alan and I go back a long way, don't we, eh? Yeah, we do indeed, yeah. Um, can I make it clear that I was never a puppeteer, okay? I was a stand-in for Frank Oz yeah. on Empire, on, uh, not Empire, on... Um, Muppet, Great Muppet, Muppet Caper. Caper. And Dark, Dark Crystal, Crystal yeah. and so, and also uh, half the puppeteers. Mm. A Canadian guy called Norton Clark yes. was a stand-in for Jim Henson. That's right. And uh, Tall very guy. nice guy. Yeah. And everybody liked him. So uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we had uh, long backing together on that. And then when was the next time we met? Uh, was it on one of the bonds? Was it? Let's see. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit? You were, oh you, yes. Yeah, yes, I was doing yeah, the Penguin Waiters on that, and yeah. you were you were in the uh, in the Ink and Paint Club, weren't you? Night Club, yeah. 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 With Jessica Rabbit, so you can see Alan the, in there. This one, he's so good that uh, one day Frank Oz, the, the puppeteers were still down in the pit, with a three three foot square or meter yeah. square by square and a meter deep, and they just lifted a panel off so the oper operators could get inside there with their monitors down here and um and then they, they can do all their work above them sort of thing at the right height for the camera and at the end of a take frank oz said who was in whichever character it was i can't remember of course and uh, he stuck his hand in the air and frank said very good puppeteering now that coming from the major important person in puppeteering world was an enormous compliment to him and every, the, the rest of the puppeteers were jealous believe me <laughs> i mean i was just a, just a that's so funny there. the weird thing is i don't remember and that me, i guess i was I in awe it very, that's so funny me. you do yes so yeah so that would be yeah 39 40 years ago i suppose yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so I don't know. I mean, Alan has. Uh, well, I remember when I first met Alan, and you know, we were talking about what what uh, Alan's history was. And I remember you telling me that you did some some modelling when you started out. Yeah, that's right. And uh, me being sixteen and ignorant of everything in the entire world, I thought that meant you made little models of things. Yes. I thought, <laughs> yeah. oh, you used to make models <laughs> of miniatures, and but no, yeah. he meant like you know, like you know, sexy catwalk runway model stuff. Oh. So. Uh, which I realized years later, that was my error. But anyway, so one oh. lives and learns uh, these things. I was uh. all fun. <laughs> we were young, or I, I was older than everybody else. But anyway, and still <laughs> am, believe it or not. I'm a lung cancer survivor. Hey. How about that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And um, the only yeah. thing is, it's left me with a, I think they call it a shadow mm. in the hospital world. And... Um, it means the air goes into this lung and then it goes disperses throughout the body afterwards, I'm afraid. So that's why I've got this stick and sometimes I have to be wheeled around because I get out of breath very quickly. Can you hear me, by the way, with, when I'm sitting back? You can hear me at the back, okay? You can, oh, that's good, as long as you can hear me. I hate to prattle on and have nothing heard. Anyway, yes. Yeah. So, but I mean, you've, you've have, is there any franchise you've not been at? Well, you, you worked on Bond stuff, didn't you? That, yeah. So what, what uh, yeah, I'd like to know about that, actually, about your Bond well, experiences. Well, what happened is... Um, James, that I, is. Yeah. Um, Living Daylights. Uh, I was sent along to uh, be an operator of uh, the <coughs> Ghetto Blaster, which is a radio on your shoulder. I had mask, oh. uh, face drive, goggles on. And uh, I pressed a button and the rocket went out and blew up the dummy. Oh. And they yeah. set it up again on the, that was on the Thursday. On the Friday, they set it up again because Prince Charles and Princess Di were coming down, going down to Gloucester to their weekend residence. And uh, they 
uh, set it up so that he pressed a button and the, the cable went to this ghetto blaster on my shoulder and um, not, I, I, I didn't operate anything <coughs> at all. It was the Prince Charles did it. So, which all, all good fun for television news that yeah. night, uh, BBC and ITV. And um, <laughs> that made them all jump because the bang, when it hit, it was near them, not me. It was down the other end of the hall. Anyway, <laughs> so um, afterwards, Charles went around uh, saying, what department are you in? And how nice <coughs> to meet you and so on. Um, it rather bored out of his brain, I think, actually. Uh, but Princess Di went whoosh, like that straight to me. Now, I don't know at the time what that was about, but I realised later, uh, because the unit were all jealous of me, <laughs> spending 15 minutes, while Charles was going around speaking to individuals, she spent the whole 15 minutes with me. And uh, I realised that it was because I was in a white smock coat and when they go to factories and <coughs> hospitals places like that they look for somebody with a white smock coat because they're a technician and can answer all their questions mm. so she did that straight to me because she thought i was a technician didn't know i was a film expert i had been around films for donkey's yeah. years anyway so i could answer all her questions so it was no trouble but yeah so it was a, an unusual thing. I've got a photo of it in my, of us t chatting. She's that far. When you're that close wow. to a lady and she's beautiful, they are beautiful. And she said the same thing about you as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we josh each other. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but Alan, I mean, you, you've been in more films than anyone in the entire world, I think, right? And TV shows, I would assume. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> I used to be uh, extra, as well as stand-in and double and anything yeah. else that came along. But uh, yes, I, 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 I did work on practically everything. <laughs> yeah. I worked on the whole of the, um, or almost all the episodes on the Space 1999, which was uh, 24 episodes, wow. I think, or 22 episodes. And uh, so I was on... Um, well, they list me in the, um, whatever, it's I, IBDM, I think it's called, um, as working on, officially on 16 episodes, mm. but I worked on a few more. Anyway, that's it. That's right. that's that was uh, 70s, one. wasn't it? Like mid-late 70s or something? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, you always uh, seemed to bump into us puppeteers a lot, didn't you, in the, in the 80s? Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. And you were yeah. on How to Get Ahead in Advertising, weren't you, as well? I think I saw you on... On, on the at Shepparton or How to Get Ahead with Richard E. Grant? I want Sorry? To, I want to say I might have bumped into you on How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Oh, right. I think you did yes, a bit on that yes, in, the, yeah. in the marquee. Oh, uh, that, that's, yeah. Is that right? That's an extra so, thing in yeah. the marquee, yeah. So, uh, and I was doing, I was working the, the there was a, a boil that grew out of Richard E. Grant's neck and it, it talked to him and then it takes over. Yeah. And uh, so, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, we met on that as well. Yep, yep, yep. That's it, so, yeah. oh my goodness me. Well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we, there's all these things that even I don't know about Alan, but well, uh, also, maybe we'll we learn. we were born in the same town. We were, yeah. Enfield, North, North London. North London. And, uh, yeah, that's it, North Enfield. London. And, uh, yeah, so we knew all the places. Yeah. Your family lived in oh, the other side of Southby Road. Didn't yeah, you? that's right. By the, off the opposite just, the swimming pool. Yes, that's correct. And uh, I was down the <coughs> Rupin, Shell Park. Down, well, almost down at London Highway at first, and then down Brimsdown, so yeah. industrial area. So they were trying to bomb but us in the war. Oh, boy. Where my mother and I, were, we used to sleep under the stairs and uh, by the... Because what happened is the bombs used to come down and blow the house up, yeah. and the parts that were standing were <coughs> the chimney stack because of all the bricks from both, for both sides of the houses, um, and also the staircase, yeah. because uh, there's so much wood the going structure. up there. So people used to sleep under the stairs in the hope of surviving, and that's what happened to us. And uh, one night, my mother must have gone like that because a doodle bug came over, and it cut. And once it cuts out, it's run out of fuel, and so it just comes out mm. and crash and, and explodes. And uh, it missed the uh, industrial area, and came down over us, fortunately, uh, to a rail the other side of a railway line at the bottom of our garden. And um, unfortunately, six kids in my class never came in again. It's, that's 
That's, that's so random, fact. isn't it? Poor, unfortunately. So random. If that really happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cheerful. Yes. No. I, I mean, it's it's all part but of the yeah. old history. Yeah, it's important, isn't it? People don't know about. Yeah, um, I didn't know that. They, they, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, there you go. All right. Well, um, yeah, I bet there's a million and one questions, like uh, you know, about I don't know stuff we've worked on or people that we've worked with or I don't know. So yeah, who's who's first, huh? Puppets, puppets Star Wars. Yeah, Jim Henson. Anything? Please go ahead. I have one question for Mike and one for Alan. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, the, your character in Return of the Jedi, when he speaks uh, in his own language, it, it sounds a bit like Japanese. It, my ears. What, what, what language was he? Yeah, what language was 9-num speaking in, in Star Wars? Uh, an excellent question. When we filmed uh, the scene in the cockpit, uh, uh, in, which was the first time he ever spoke, of course, in Return of the Jedi, um, the script just said that he chatted an alien language, and so we knew that he would be, his dialogue would, would be replaced later with something they didn't know what it was going to be yet. So I actually wrote my, my lines, uh, I, pe I penciled them in, it, to what I thought they would be with Billy Dee's responses, you know, logical things like, you know, we're not getting a reading on the shield and TIE fighters at 12 o'clock and things like that, just stuff that made sense. So I wrote it in my script thinking, well, I might as well speak in English because otherwise it doesn't, it's silly. You can't just say random, you know, everything needs to make sense in the acting sense of the word and also for, for Billy Dee's responses too. And the film was running a little bit behind at that time. So Richard Marquand was on stage five mm. directing The Rancor Pit while um, George Lucas directed the actual cockpit scenes. So uh, he was sitting in his director's chair. I remember the morning of the shoot. Uh, I just showed him what I'd written and said, can I, can I say this, please, in English? You know, and he just looked it up and down and said, yeah, sure, that's fine. And that was pretty well the only time he ever said anything. And so I spoke in English and laid down a guide track. And then, uh, when it, then after the film was finished, it went, of course, to Ben Burt. Uh, it's a, a Skywalker uh, sound and uh, an ILM and uh, he had a uh, you know they tried to make all the different characters sound different to each other so there's not not too many similarities so Jabba had his own sound and the Ewoks had their own sound so Nine Numb had to have his own sound as well and they had a, uh, a Kenyan intern working at Skywalker sound at the time so so uh, Ben Burt said well let's bring him in and have him do some stuff so uh, he actually spoke Kenyan and it was a, it was a dialect, a specific dialect of Kenya. So uh, every, so he's a big he's a big hero over there in Kenya now apparently. Um, and Lupita, uh, who of course uh, plays Maz in the new films, you know, she grew up knowing that character and was a big fan of his because this guy spoke their language, you know, uh, which was uh, one of the few times in Star Wars where they actually speak you know any other language other than English. So uh, that's what it was. And then um, it was a guy called Kipsang Rotish. And uh, they found him a, again about a month before um, The Force Awakens opened. And he was in Kenya teaching. And they recorded some new stuff for him. And so now he continues to do the voice in all the new films as well for us. So we've not met yet. Uh, but uh, uh, well, I'm hoping that they'll bring him over for something like Celebration Anaheim, perhaps. And then we can have a, a little sort of reunion together, which would be quite nice, I think. So that's, that's the story behind his, his uh, speech. Yeah. And Alan, um, when you were in the Living Daylights, do you remember having any conversations with Desmond Llewellyn to play the cue? No, I didn't. I, he was on the same scene mm. uh, early, <clears throat> and um, then when it came to the actual firing of the, you know, me actually pressing the button, they cleared everyone <clears throat> off the set, really, you know, other mm. than the uh, technicians involved in assembling it and so on. Uh, they didn't want anybody anywhere near a anything like that. And also they wanted to keep it all as secret as possible, the, the, what was going on on that whole scene. They didn't want rumours going out about explosions and so on. <laughs> so they just cleared. In yeah. fact, um, the, my, the, the fellow extras, uh, male and female, were locked in their dressing rooms <laughs> upstairs. That's not a safety in, hazard. Pump? They were locked in their rooms. Yeah, they were. <coughs> they were Good locked heavens. in. Well, they, they, they were locked in the passage for a wow. start. Oh, yeah. And then, then locked in the room. Gosh. But um, they, they didn't want any word getting out about what was going on on there. Uh, and also, it's a bit dangerous when you get explosions going on. And uh, so 
Uh, they took charge, and uh, when it came to the actual explosion itself, it was quite okay, because it was right down the other end of the hall from me. Thank you very much. And uh, I just had to press a little button like that. It was quite <laughs> easy. Easy peasy for me. <laughs> when, when Desmond died, I, I just thought, well, the James Bond movies won't be the same anymore. It's a, no, a nice it, guy. Well, it's a car crash, yeah. wasn't it? I just loved his banter with, uh, yeah. with Bond. Yeah. Do you pay attention, 007? <laughs> Classic. Correct. Classic. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm a child. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, so, you know, Jim Henson's world was big for me. You know? Yeah. And it was really hard, that transition when you did the CGI. Everything seems so fake because puppeteering is it's very emotional, really. It's yeah, like, very you know, tangible and, yeah. You were saying that, and so thank you for very much. Oh. Well, thank you, yeah. Yeah, CG sort of crept in a little bit there, and Jim was also interested in the technology and using, uh, like he, even during the early 80s, when it wasn't even a thing yet, he was talking about doing a show where puppeteers could puppeteer CG characters in real time using the same techniques. So he was a, you know, way ahead of his time. The, the, la the uh, owl, the computer owl in Labyrinth was the first uh, computer-generated animal on film. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was Jim as well. You said you're still in, into the puppeteering? Yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's, more, there's much more puppets and creatures. It never went away, you know, we were always still doing puppetry in some form or other. And I knew it would just be a matter of time before, you know, people kind of got the idea that, that uh, thanks in part to JJ and, and Kathleen Kennedy and those guys in the new Star Wars films saying we want to make it practical and bring back, you know, rubber creatures again and, and puppets and things. So, uh, so yeah, now um, we're sort of, I think we're finding, we're starting to find a, a maturity in the industry where producers and directors are starting to use CG for what it does best and puppets for what they do best and also bringing them together sometimes a little bit so, you know, that you get these hybrid things uh, when necessary and using the technology to remove rods and puppeteer heads and things like that as well uh, and combining uh, creatures in, in other scenes and extending sets. So, so we're, seeing, we're seeing the industry grow up a little bit now, I think, with, with uh, the, the technology. But people always say they'd rather see something real, uh, you know, like a, a puppet or a creature or an animatronic, even, you know, even if it, for all its limitations and mistakes, you know, but that makes it real as well. CG can often do too much, and so people can over-animate sometimes, or the physics mm -hmm. Uh, can be wrong on something. I, I did do CG animation for several years at Pixar and ILM. Uh, so I animated dinosaurs and, and creatures on, on uh, Attack of the Clones and stuff. So, and a little bit of Yoda, funnily enough. That's why I went there. I wanted to actually animate Yoda because I knew how he was puppeteered. I knew the, the, the mechanics and kinetics of how Frank puppeteered his stuff, having to copy him in, in Muppet programs. So I knew exactly how he held his arm and why Yoda moved the way he did. And I wanted to reproduce that in CG, but because I got pulled off on J Jurassic Park, by the time I went back to, to uh, episode two, uh, the shots have all kind of been allocated and they didn't want to change the way things were done. And so he ended up being a little bit more, more animated than I think he should have been uh, in terms of his movement. Uh, and I wanted to reprogram how his face was controlled. He, he had all these like different points, like dozens and dozens of animation control points on his face and I wanted to gang them together so they'd be worked more like an animatronic face would work. And I, I built that and it worked great with just a few, like six controls. You could do all this stuff with him, like the puppet ad, but I couldn't, I couldn't overwrite their program. I couldn't save it. So it kind of got, you know, it was too late, but <clears throat> I think he got a little bit better in the next film. They, they refined the animation a bit more, but I still think the model didn't quite, it didn't quite look right. You know, his head was too round and, in the yeah, hair was weird and stuff like that. And he always looked a bit angry and scowly and he had this weird mouth thing. So I don't think they quite got it right. But I was there when they, uh, before they started and they showed me, uh, the animation director showed me the test, the Yoda test, uh, the CG test that they showed George uh, when George agreed, oh, okay, let's do him as his Yoda as CG. And um, what they did is they copied some scenes from Empire Strikes Back 
uh, of Yoda, so they basically copied all the movements and angles. So of course it looked like Yoda because they were copying a real, you know, it was almost like rotoscoping, but in CG. So it looked great, and it was very a rough model, very faceted. You know, it wasn't all finished or anything. So it looked like Yoda, but of course they didn't use any reference when they came to do to animate the shots in the film. They didn't have puppet reference, which they could have done actually, you know, video reference. And that's something Pixar does a lot. They they get encourage their animators to act everything out on video and see what it feels like and the timing and, and look at that on video and, and sort of not rotoscope but at least get understand what's happening physically and they should have done that I think with Yoda in the animation but of course now he's a puppet again in the in the last film so there we go right yeah Darth um, um, Vader uh, Dave um, is very tall, uh, not as tall as uh, Peter Mayhew. I stood in for Peter Mayhew one, one day, uh, uh, for an hour rather, uh, and they gave me a garden broom, which in Britain is a stick with a brush that's horizontal like that. And uh, uh, David Tomlin took me on the set and said, stand there. I said, and they gave me this stick and he stuck it up in the air so the brush was right up there somewhere, about seven foot nine. <laughs> I said, Peter, uh, um, um, Dave, what am I doing? He said, you're standing in for Peter Mayhew, Chewbacca. And I just, oh, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. It's the end of my life, as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, however, uh, yeah, so it was all wonderful. They were all lovely people. Uh, but Dave Prowse was a very, very strong-willed person. Um, I, I unfortunately knew uh, because my mother had Alzheimer's, uh, I knew before anybody else that he had it in the early stages because he couldn't remember. We did a, a show uh, in um, uh, Vichy in central France mm. and he couldn't remember anything about it two years later. And uh, it, it, he was definitely there. He, he collapsed in a chair and, and all sorts of things happened. But uh, he was a strong-willed person and uh, he got into trouble with a couple of times with George Lucas, Lucas because of this strong will that he had. And um, it's a sad loss because he was a nice guy. He was a really nice guy. So yeah. like Peter Mayhew as well, mm. two lovely big guys they yeah. were. Uh, just, you know, we had them and they're gone. It's sad. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, were you able to uh, keep a souvenir or a prop from anyone here? Sorry? Well, were you able to keep a souvenir from any of the shows? No. Everything was owned by Lucasfilm. Everything. Anybody who says that they got this, that and the other are liars. They're copies that have been made outside the industry. Anything that was used in the film was all <coughs> Lucas yeah. film. It, that was his the stuff, the his archives. property. Yeah. And um, I heard that later that Bosk was in um, his muse personal museum in uh, in was in uh, California. Yeah. Um, was it Luke Skywalker Ranch? Skywalker is it Ranch. Yeah. And um, in there, and, and it's it's in a lineup <coughs> in case he ever wants to use it again. And it's up to him, of course. They, they did a, a film the, uh, where Harrison's early film, uh, uh, his youth, when he's a young man, um, I can't remember what it was called now. Hmm. But anyway, um, and that was a few years ago. And um, they uh, mentioned in that film that something like um, Bosk would never do that, uh, which was a nice throwback to Bosque many years later, but uh, that's the only reference there's ever been uh, and the only use of anything to do with him. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so. same, same here, I guess. Um, remember Eddie Knight, the uh, yeah. prop guy? Yeah. So he gave me a few bits from Dark Crystal. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I have uh, like a, the, one of the drinking goblets from yeah. the Skeksis Banquet. But he, I never stole anything, but he gave it to me. Yeah. And there were a few bits of the uh, rubber food that we were eating off the table. 
And that's kind of about, and a few things I've picked out of skips, some, some set plans that were lying in, literally in skips outside the stage, yeah. stuff like that. So, but I've never, um, yeah, actually Can stolen I, or removed anything, yeah. The, the, the first one, they did um, chuck everything out. Uh, you know, the, <coughs> yeah. all the, the laser swords and so on, <coughs> they just ch chucked them all in a skip because they didn't think they were going to need them again. Yeah. That was the exception. Yeah, that really first. was an exception. Um, did you work on in on the first Indiana Jones movie? Um? Did you work on the first Indiana Jones? Uh, let's uh, see now. The Raiders first. of the Lost Ark. Raiders. Uh, that was Elstree, wasn't it, as well? Yeah, it was, yeah. I, I remember when we came into the studio, uh, it was either Muppet Caper or Dark Crystal, I guess Muppet Caper, they had the styrofoam uh, plaster Anubis figures outside the stage. Yeah. Because I guess they'd just been you know, filming the Well of Souls or whatever oh, outside there. Yeah. Stage one, two, three, and four. Yeah. Um, and they were just skipped outside. It's like, wow, wouldn't it be great to have one of those things? And they, yeah. they throw so much stuff away. You know, it's horrible. Oh, it's so yeah. sad. And, yeah. the, you know, if, you could, if I could have taken it home on the bus, I certainly until, would have done that. <laughs> until they realized how much they were worth. Oh, yeah, yeah, now, yeah. And then they hung on to them as long as they could. And repaired them, took yeah. the trouble to repair things. Because they're which valuable, they they're part of, part of our film history now, aren't they? I mean, um, they're they part are. of our history. Yeah. Yeah. So. Not just part of your history, they're part of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can have yeah. another, we've got time for another question, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, anybody, there must be something. Yeah, okay. Here we go, Let, let's go over there and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, it's for both of you. Okay. Uh, what was it like the first time you saw yourself? Oh, first time you saw an, yourself in a, in a figure or a toy. Uh, very surreal for me um, and very exciting, although I didn't think it was me. It's like, oh, there's that guy that I've helped with. You know, I sort of saw it as a, sec a second person. Whereas in the, in the new films, they took a scan of me in the costume and reduced it down into a toy, so it really is me. So that's kind of like even freakier now. It's like, oh, that's like a little mini me and it, with a little belly and everything. It's like, oh, dear. So, uh, yeah, that, that is... In, in a way, that's been weirder for me than the very first, first one. How about you? Uh, the, yeah, the, it's uncanny. Um, you, you're looking at yourself in a costume. And you can't really remember doing it, but uh, you know you did it. And uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of not believing and believing at the same time. It's abstract, odd isn't it? When, it's you're abstract. In a, when you're in a costume, yeah. yeah. It really is odd. And then we had, yeah. Did you voice any of the, did you voice your character in any of like the Star Wars animated shows? No, no, Muppets. So I've done a lot of uh, voice work in, um, in a lot of Muppet programs. We do assorted chickens and pigs and one-liners and did a lot of voice work in the uh, Muppet Christmas Carol and singing on the album on that as well. So I have, uh, yeah, I've, you hear me in that and uh, done some stuff for Cartoon Network, some uh, just animation stuff. So uh, yeah, other, other vocal things, but not Star Wars, I don't think. Yeah, Not yet. Ah! Uh, <laughs> me, no, because I was never an actor. I was always an extra, stand-in, and double. So I was never a, an actor as such. Although you, you are acting. When you, I see you on screen, you're definitely I've, performing. I've, 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 I've in, in theatre, I'm yeah. a stage manager, and you're expected to play small parts. So that, I did some, but yeah. I never classed myself as an actor because that really is a profession and they are very good at what they do. I was not very good at it, so I admit it and kept away from it. Well, what you did do, you were excellent at, and that was a <laughs> lot, so yeah. <laughs> And you, you're still good now, so there you go. Yeah, yeah so uh, anything else? Anything else to wrap it up at all? Or anything you must know? Or ha Okay, here we go at the end. What's your favourite uh, puppet to puppeteer? Favourite puppet to puppeteer? Um, every once in a while I've had to put on Kermit and double for him. Just once in a rare blue moon. And it's just weird because it's like, this is so iconic. It's so wonderful and amazing at the same time. But it's also like... You know, because if you don't do it right, it's just gonna. Because it, it's a sock, basically. You know, yeah. you got to make it look like him. Otherwise, it's just it's just a, uh, an imposter. You know, so it's, he's really hard to do. Probably harder than anybody. But but you know, it's fun because he's this he's this iconic character. But 
Um, I think I think my favourite has been a character that I created years ago um, for uh, an English um, uh, satellite uh, ch children's channel, and he was sort of another alien character, funnily enough. But he was kind of me gone a bit even more wonky than I already am. So mm -hmm. he, he could he could sort of say things that I could never say, which is saying a lot, basically. <laughs> uh, so uh, I kind of like that. He's a, you know an alter ego that uh, that I can. I can use uh, uh, and uh, let go with and run with a bit. So I'm probably going to rebuild him at some point and, and bring him back out yeah. into the world, uh, hopefully soon. So, yes. Yes, Diddly Squat, his name is. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. So I, uh, anything else? Are we, are we good? Or, uh, yes. Are you sure? That wasn't three hours, was it? Thank you. <laughs> May the force be with you.